Good morning, Hope. Are you ready to worship the king of the universe this morning? Yeah. I'm torn between myself and your truth. These cursed memories forever seeping through. Oh, my thirst for myself, let me want it more. Till I found myself face down on your shore. You say, come to the river. Come to the river, drink from the cup I pour, and thirst no more. My restless heart pulled me astray to my selfish pride. I became my whole self. But you praise the thirst in me with no drink inside. Cause I could not see till I saw through your eyes. You say, Come to the river. Oh, and lay yourself down. Let your heart be. You say, come to the river, drink from the cup I pour, and thirst no more. You say, come to the river, oh, and lay yourself down, let your heart be found. You say, come to the river, oh, and lay yourself down, let your heart be found. You say, come to the river. Good morning, Hope. Thank you so much for everybody that's here joining us today, and thank you to everybody that's joining us online as well. I, we have some exciting announcements today. Make sure you're paying attention good because you don't want to miss anything that I'm getting ready to say, okay? Our very first announcement, we are excited here at Hope to announce that Sandy and Sue have arranged for Hope to sponsor Operation Christmas Child. This is an awesome way to be a part of evangelizing here at Hope. We're going to take a, just a minute to watch this short video. There are children's lives around the world right now that are linked to our story and that we're linked to their story through what Samaritan's First and Operation Christmas Child makes reality. 
church can sometimes think that it's all about what I'm doing inside my walls. And so part of what this allows us to do is connect in the larger church. We are opening doors for other churches and other parts of the world to do ministry in their local community. The shoebox opens a door. It's more than a box. It's church planting. It's community transformation. Beyond the shoeboxes, the greatest journey disciples them and nurtures them. One church can only do so much, but the church sharing a common vision allow for us to connect across the nations to reach people that no one church could ever reach by themselves. There's a real story on the other end of that box, and so why wouldn't you want to be a part of a story like this? information that you need so that you can be a part of this can be found on the table out in the ministry area. So please make sure you help us here at Hope be a part of this great opportunity. As the body of Christ, we're called to belong. So there's wi things that happen in circles of people than in rows on Sunday. So make sure you find a growth group that you get to be a part of. There's a full list on the back of your bulletin. It's a great way to get connected. This is an exciting one. Are you ready? Okay. It's that time of year here at Hope. It is for our annual Fall Harvest Festival. Where's the excitement? <laughs> this is an opportunity, Hope, that we're inviting the children in the community to our property where we get to help engage in our with our children. So this is what we need from you. We need you to help sign up. There's minis There's sign-ups sheets out in the fellowship area make sure you sign up so that you can come and help if you've done the archery ministry in the past we'd like to have you volunteer to help at that booth so make sure you talk to them about that and something that everybody can be a part of whether you can be here that day or not is candy how many people here love candy right how many people love giving candy to children and then sending them home Right, so bring your candy. We've got two bins out under the table out there. Make sure you do that. This is our way to help our community hope. And now we've got something special. I hope this really is a special time in our history. Uh, because today, after a long, prayerful process, we're going to ap appoint two people uh, to our pastoral board. I'd like to ask uh, Steve and Gina to come on up, and then present members of the pastoral board, if you would join me up here. Come on up. Thanks, buddy. This is uh, a really an important uh, process. The board asked me to uh, put together a process of how we uh, find our uh, new boards. I believe that, our, that God raises up, the Holy Spirit raises up spiritual leaders. And really our task is to identify who he's raised up. And um, so I put together a process and I brought it back to the board and then they gave input to it. We, we finalized it. And... Uh, I really take this as an important thing, um, not just because I'm a senior pastor and I'm part of the board and it, because it impacts the future of the church, but because uh, I was raised uh, by a little lady who taught me to, to uh, uh, support the leaders of the church, to not badmouth the leaders of the church, but encourage them. And uh, so this is a huge thing. This is in our history. And the process... Um, we studied passages about spiritual leaders, like John 13, where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He did the job of the lowest job in the household, and he says, you know what I've done to you? He says, I wash your feet. He says, he talked about how the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over, and it's all about authority. 
but he says, not so among you. And he says, in my organization, in my church, you're servants. The greatest are servants. So we said, whoever we select will be servants. And we studied passages like Timothy and Titus. The Bible talks about elders and deacons and deaconesses. We're not into titles around here. We're more into what do we do. And we look at the work of spiritual leaders that um, we have on the team. Um, <clears throat> it talks about family life. You know, if someone doesn't have a good marriage or a good family life, why would you want them to be leading God's family? It talks about um, the idea of having a walk with God and having um, um, be living out our mission, building relationships that last forever. We believe that's important. It talks about desire. If someone desires to lead, they desire a good thing, it says. And so we actually had one person that decided not to continue the process, a good person that's still serving among us. So desire is important, and, uh, and, and the, the, the Bible talks about pe- temperaments because there's a lot of pressure on spiritual leaders. And um, um, so we looked at people like that and on our list. We put forth names together. It was awesome because we had a lengthy list of people, and we look forward to new people we're going to continue to ask each year to prayerfully consider serving. Um, we're, I'm no dummy. I, I, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I, I really didn't want to just all of a sudden bring in six or seven new people. The board, the present board that we have, along with Walter Hansford, Walter uh, was one of the people that brought me here. He has now gone to be with the Lord. We gave him a plaque uh, that said, um, that had a picture of a shepherd on there, thanking him for his years of service as an elder, as a shepherd. And he said, uh, this means more to me than any award I've ever gotten. And this is a guy who fought Hitler and had a purple heart. And he understood about leadership in the kingdom. And Walt was one of our leaders that we honored still. Uh, and uh, that, that board, the present board with Walt, uh, took the risk to bring me on when we couldn't afford me. And to, to start things like Rock the Ridge when we couldn't afford it. And now we've had 16, 17 if you count the one rained out. Uh, we, uh, who's keeping track? We've uh, seen a children's ministry start and teen ministry and multiple ministries. Um, no band was here at the time. That, b- that board has continued, and we want that continued united DNA to continue with our board. Uh, we love each other. We cry together. We get angry sometimes. We work it out. Uh, we disagree on certain things, but we always walk out of there united. It's um, the most delightful board I've ever worked with, and I thank God for them. So that's kind of for you to know the background. We had a list. We asked a few and they, they start the process. They go home and talk to their spouse because that person is also carrying the burden with them. And it's really important uh, that they support it and are, are good with that. We uh, ask them to pray about it, come back. We continue to pray and we interview them. And then we make a dis- decision together. Yeah, we believe these people would be good to serve on the board. Then we put the names to the body. And we say if anyone has a scriptural reason why this person shouldn't sh- serve on our leadership team to let us know. And we had no one uh, give us any reason from scripture why they should not serve in our pastoral team. And uh, so we feel led at this time to ordain these two. Uh, I want to tell you about the job on the pastoral board before I, I, we ordain them. When you look in scripture, uh, one of the things that the apostles, the early leaders, they were involved with ministry. And we say that everyone on the board should be involved in some ministry. We are not to do all the ministry, but in our lifestyle, we shouldn't be calling the body to ministry if we're not in some kind of ministry. And um, um, small churches sometimes think that, that don't grow. Struggling churches, they think that the pastor or the board has to be at everything. And you can't do something unless the pastor shows up and opens his shirt and that S is there, you know, Superman. Okay, we can begin with, you know, and that, hi- that hinders the church. So we do some ministry, but not all the ministry. But the next thing we see in Scripture is that they're to be equippers. In Ephesians 4, it says, when talking about the spiritual leaders, that they're to equip the members of the body for works of ministry. And that's where we get the quote that every member has a ministry. You guys are a sleeping giant. The last thing I want is that all you do is sit there and listen to Brother Golden Lips every week. You, you, some of you have things that you can do that I can't do, that we can't do. You have talents and gifts, and we want to unleash the sleeping giant. So we see part of our job is not only to be involved in ministry, but to equip and coach ministry leaders. And uh, we, have a, we have a diagram that I use at the membership class, and it's like it looks almost like a hierarchy, but you turn it upside down because Jesus says it's different in my kingdom. It's upside down. At the bottom of our structure 
is where it says Christ is the cornerstone. He's building his church. And then you have the pastoral team on the bottom. And then flowing above are the ministries, the ministry leaders. And so we see our job as coaching, praying for our ministry leaders. We're also called to be overseers. That term is used for the spiritual leaders in the, in the scriptures. That means we, we, we're accountable to the financial uh, situation of the church. We are not a board that's going to talk about money, all the whole meaning, like some boards are tempted to do. We, we're going to talk about other things that are important to our role, but we are accountable. So we have a report from our treasurer. We know where everything goes. We know where the money's, what's coming in, and uh, we set the amount. We agree on the amount for the budget goal that's in the bulletin each year, and that continues to grow as the ministries grow. And then um, in our meetings, along with that, we talk about, as overseers, the, the facility. We look at needs of the facility. And, you know, we say things like, Stan, when are we going to get that big pile out in the backyard taken care of? Uh, we have day-to-day uh, um, -day operations run by the staff, but the staff is accountable to the board. And um, we look at the vision of the church. Are we accomplishing our purpose? Are we building relationships that last forever? Is there anything we need to change? Anything we need to stop doing? Anything we need to do? And then... Uh, we see prayer is so huge. The apostles said we must not stop prayer, the ministry of the word in Acts 6. And so we do a lot of that together collectively. We, we pray individually, of course. And then we see our role as shepherds. The scri scriptures talk about spiritual leaders as shepherds. Shepherds feed, shepherds lead, she shepherds care for the sheep. Uh, so when we meet together, we talk about people, how people, sorry, we talk about you guys, but we talk about how people are doing, any people concerns we pray about, and if there's a need we can help with. We, I like to quote, shepherds smell like sheep, and uh, so we should be talking about our people that God has called us to shepherd. So that's kind of how the role is that we see it as uh, ministry involved, equippers or coaches, overseers, shepherds, and uh, Gina Darby uh, believed in God as a little girl. She was involved in ministry. And then when she came to Hope, uh, she committed to Christ here, was baptized here, uh, committed to membership, started right off the bat, was involved in ministry. Her fiancé, Donald, uh, was also baptized here. Then they were married here. They've continued for around five years, four or five years, to be involved in multiple ministry. She's a teacher. She's taught us. She's an a administrator. She works on staff with our ministry connections and, and is a great coach with our ministry leaders. We've already had improvements. It's helping in our organization to help us continue to grow since she's come on that. Uh, she leads a growth group. She's taught and baptized someone with her own hands, so she's involved in our mission of making disciples. Steve Kinsey uh, first came, he and Trudy, uh, to a Rock the Ridge. Um, he saw a sign in the grocery store about the Rock the Ridge, and he said to Trudy, let's go to that. And Trudy told me he usually doesn't do, go to those things, but he wanted to go. He didn't know what he was getting himself into, uh, but he came to Rock the Ridge, and he came to Hope, and uh, they have children in the Lord. They have grandchildren in the Lord. Their grandkids have staying here. They did an awesome job. Um, and, and Steve's been involved in multitude, uh, multiple ministries, too, like landscaping. And he's used his own hands and funds to help with our remodel. Uh, he's been a part of growth group. And, and, and he and Trudy both have been involved in ministries. And both Donald and Trudy are for and supportive of their mates at this time. So I want to ask two charges, the first one to the church, the second one to these new potential board members, um, listen to this passage that the Hebrew writer wrote. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they watch over you as, as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. This is one of the passages that my mom taught me about that taught me not to badmouth the leaders of the church because they're doing stuff you don't know. They got stuff behind the scenes they're praying with, they're dealing with, and you rather work at making their work a joy and not a burden. So I want to ask you, church, do you commit to support these new leaders as spiritual leaders on our pastoral boards? If so, please, please say yes. yes. Amen. That, just like first service, right off. Awesome. And then to Steve... And to Gina, I want to read this verse from Paul in Acts 20, where he said, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Do you commit to faithfully shepherd the church of God? Amen.
At this time, we're going to pray. Um, the scriptures show that you ordain uh, as a body, as a church. We don't ask some other organization to ordain our leaders. We do as a body, and so at this time, our board will do that. First place, I don't smell like sheep, I don't think, <laughs> or I try not to. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be with these two people. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this church. I want to thank all men and women in, that have served our country in the military, and they have been so instrumental of giving us the opportunity to be here and support our law, local law enforcement, as so many try to do so much good. I appreciate Sam so much and how he has made our church grow. And I think I've been on the board for before Stan, and, and, and it's just a pleasure to be in this situation. And I'm so glad to get two new members to argue with, I mean, to work with and to be with. They're just such a blessing, both of them. I know them both very well, and, and I thank you, Lord, for bringing them to us. Amen. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us to you and Gina. We hope she's okay. We have prayed for Flora since she knew her and gave her a memory and asked her not to pray in the jail. Lord, we we know that it's important to pray, and so at this board meeting, we sought out and Emma in prayer. And this is really important, especially if there are difficult things you have to get through. Lord, also another important thing is our attitude. We have to bring a take good attitude to our meetings because our attitude um, it changes how we respond and also how we take action in front of the men of God. We just thank you so much for these two, and we know that they will be good servants, and we thank you as well. Amen. I want to just continue this prayer. And Lord, I lift up Steve and his spouse, Judy, and their family to you and God. Lord, I just thank you so much for bringing them to the board and to help us reach the souls of Jesus for you and for the church. And we ask this in your precious name. Father, I thank you for this time in our history. It's so special now to think about when we were 40 and now we've got a couple services. We're appointing new shepherds. We have one shepherd, Walt, who's gone to be with you now and watching on, I believe. I thank you for Tom and how Tom has been involved in teaching small groups and our whole church and in He's one of the most evangelistic people I know that's constantly sharing his faith. And there's people here that he's reached out to. And I thank you for Marcella, that she's a prayer warrior and uh, that she's with her own hands made cards personalized to welcome people or people in need and visited people and involved in our women's ministry. And I thank you for Nancy, who does our hospital ministry and makes sure that people are visited and keeps us all in prayer and knowing how people are doing and is involved in our growth groups and our women's ministry. And uh, Father, I. I thank you for the, the blessing of teaching here and being a pastor and um, having a growth group and being involved in ministry. And now to see these two come on, God, I just thank you for this new dynamic. I thank you for what you've done in the last six years. I pray we haven't seen anything yet that we will be risky stepping out in faith and focus on our mission to bring just one more to Christ and to build relationships that last forever. We commit these two to the greatest work there is on earth and in working in the church and building the church. God bless them. Build a hedge of protection around their homes as they will be attacked. Watch over Donald and Trudy as well as uh, Gina and Steve and, and protect them. God, just as there'll be trials, there's going to be so many mountaintops, God, and we thank you in advance. Use them powerfully and use this all to your glory. In the name of the great shepherd, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. Come on down. And now uh, find three people and say, do you have any regrets?
Salvation Army just got robbed. Looks like I'm leaving. Needed. Looks like I'm leaving. There's no place like home. There's no place. There's no place like home. Home, home. When you're leaving, leaving. When you're Changed, dazed and confused. My spirit is left wanting something more than my selfish hopes and my selfish dreams. I'm lying with my face down on the floor, I'm crying out for more. I'm crying out for more. Give me words to speak, to let my spirit sleep. Cause I can't think of anything worth saying. But I know that I owe you my life. So give me words to speak, to let my spirit sleep. I want 
Make me broken so I can be healed. Cause I'm so calloused and now I can't feel. I want to run to you with heart wide open. Make me broken. Make me empty. So I can be filled Cause I'm still holding On to my will And I'm completed When you are with me Make me empty Till you are my one desire Till you are my one true love Till you are my breath, my everything. Lord, please keep making me. Make me lonely so I can be yours. So I want no one more than you, Lord. Cause in the darkness, I know you will hold me. Make me lonely. Lift our voices, hope. Till you are my one desire. Till you are my one true love. Till you are my breath, my everything. Lord, please keep me. Thank 
As we continue through our series, I Choose, we are learning all kinds of things that require us to make a choice. And when we look at Jesus, we see the choices that he made. Jesus chose to follow the will of the Father. He chose to sacrifice his life for us. And as followers of Jesus, we have a choice. And we choose the good news of the gospel. And because of that, because of Jesus, because of his body and his blood, we are a forever family in Christ, destined to spend eternity with our creator. And as we take communion this morning as a family, as the body of Christ, we remember his body and his blood that he freely chose to give for us. in my face and you walked away but I wasn't waiting for you till I wasn't waiting for you I've always been with you right by your side through all of your trials all I could do and I wasn't waiting for you. Yes, I wasn't waiting for you. So now that it's come now, you've asked for forgiveness. Drop down on your knees, crying, I'm ready to lend this. And open my eyes. You back in. I told you I loved you right to the end. I told you I loved you right from the start. So, do you come home? stripped away and I simply come longing 
anxious to bring something that's a work that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, or a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, or a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Let's sing that again. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Can you tell us more about the flattened marriage? It's full of regrets and comes rested on a bed of half-boiled excuses and unfinished to-do lists. Oh, that sounds nice. It's our anniversary. Congratulations, how many years? No idea. We can't remember. How about dessert on the house? Tonight's selection is a low motivation pie. Well, that's our favorite. Let me get that order going for you. to years of neglect. Hey, Hope Church, second service. You glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you also if you joined us online. When we did our uh, ordination of our new pastoral board, one person I didn't mention that would have loved to have been here is Dasu. Dasu, someone else that serves on our board, has done mentoring and worked in the lives of people and Worked in some really tough, challenging times. Uh, has also uh, helped out when we did uh, transitions with different ministries. They couldn't be here today because Lee, her husband, is going through a tough time, had a rough night. And I want to keep them in prayer and keep them before the body also. So welcome to I Choose. We're in a series called I Choose. And we made the premise at the beginning that we are the sum total of today of choices we made in the past. Whoever we are now is based on decisions we've made. Who we are going to be in the future is based on decisions that we make now and will continue to make. So choices 
are important. And uh, we started off the first week with choosing purpose over popularity, giving up the idea of trying to please everybody and living for an audience of one. And that doesn't mean we don't love people. We love people, but our goal is not to make everybody happy. It's to live to, for purpose. And then didn't Dave Jackson do an awesome job last week? Uh, yeah, hey, man, if you, if you weren't here, you can check that on online like I did. Uh, Battle Cry did awesome, and Dave's message on choosing surrender over control was so powerful. And uh, next week, we'll conclude this series with choosing the important over the urgent. Does anybody like me that you have these important stuff you want to do, but you keep getting busy with urgent things, fires to put out? And we'll talk about that next week. Today, we're talking about choosing discipline over regret. I'm going to break a rule. Like in seminaries and places where they teach you how to speak, they say, begin with some kind of positive. It can be a funny thing, a joke, or something positive to catch people's attention and hold their attention as you move to where you want to go. Now you know how I try to manipulate you every week. <laughs> uh, but uh, today I'm going to break the rule and start with something negative. They, just, they, they usually say, don't start off with something negative. But I'm going to begin today with something negative, and that is that you, every single one of us in the building here, you are going to experience pain. Every single one of us is going to experience pain. Jesus said it this way in John 16, 33, in this life, you will have trouble. And we know the positive part. He says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you become a Christian, everything's just going to be wonderful all the time. Bless God. It's just going to be piece of cake. No, he's a, he's a leveler. He, te he tells his would-be disciples the truth. If you're going to follow me, there's going to be a cross. If you're going to follow me in this life, you will have trouble. Now, some of the troubles, some of the pain that you and I face is beyond our control. Someone we love very much walks out or betrays us. Uh, we get in some type of accident that changes our life forever or our loved ones. The company downsizes and all of a sudden you lost your job. You're looking for a job. Uh, your kid brings home a kitten and all of a sudden you have a cat. You know, there's some pain that can come into our life that's beyond our control. Got a bunch of cat owners out here. Uh, <laughs> sometimes we have a choice, though, be, uh, between the types of pain we're going to endure or deal with. There's the pain as, as a child of obeying our parents as they say or choosing to do something else. And then we have the pain of consequences later. Did anybody have a dad like me uh, or a mom that could deal out some consequences? There's the pain of studying now or the pain of retaking the class later. There's the pain of saying no to temptations now and the pain of trying to beat the addiction or the, the, the problem we've got into later. There's the pain of living within our means or the pain of trying to climb out of debt later. Uh, and this message is about choosing pain, the pain of discipline now instead of the pain of regret later. And here's a definition of the word discipline. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. That's the definition of discipline. I like the word, the root word discipline, the first part of it is like disciple. You can't be a disciple without some form of discipline. We make a choice to follow Jesus. We make a choice to live by faith. It takes discipline to continue to live by faith in a fallen world that's all about here and now and we're, you know, our homes uh, through the tube and other ways are just, you know, bombarded with another way of life. And we have to discipline ourselves to live by faith. And so that's part of being a disciple. Now, most of us know what to do in a lot of circumstances in our life. Our problem is not we don't know enough. Uh, it's being consistent. My problem is not not knowing what to do. My problem is doing what I know I'm supposed to do. And, and uh, we live in an information age, so if there is more we want to learn, we can learn so much more. It's amazing how fast now we have stuff at our fingertips. You know, I, when I started the ministry, we started buying books. you got to have a library, and I got all these books 
But now all those books you can actually Google and get online and get those commentaries immediately. That would have saved me some money if I had it back then, you know. But uh, it's amazing how easy we can get so much information. We can ask Siri a question and get the answer immediately, maybe with a little attitude, but we get the answer. Uh, we can go to Wikipedia. Uh, you can YouTube. How do you grill a filet mignon medium? And it'll actually, there'll, there'll be people that'll show you how to do it, and it actually works. And so we have all this information at our fingertips. The challenge is doing what we know we're supposed to do. And there's this passage in Romans 7 where Paul deals with this struggle, this battle we're in. In Romans 7, see if you identify with what he says here. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is, what? I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I, what? I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, can anybody relate to Paul's struggle here? I've heard some scholars say Paul is talking about what life was like before Jesus, but as a Christian now, he doesn't have that struggle anymore. My thought on that is the Greek word for that is belogna. Uh, I, I think it's a battle all the days of our life to make the right choices, and we're human beings, and we're going to have some good days, and we're going to have some bad days, and we need grace. And Jesus gives us victory, first of all, over sin, you're saved. If you're a son or daughter of God through faith, you're right with God right now, and you are the rest of your life living by faith, trusting on what he did. I don't want anybody to hear this message today on discipline as a we're trying to work our way to heaven. We're trying to save ourselves. You guys that know me know that I don't believe that the gospel of behaviorism, that all of our righteous deeds are filthy rags compared to goodness of God, that there's nothing we can do to earn our way, that Christianity is the only faith system where God says, I want you to believe and trust in what I've done rather than believe and trust in what you've done. But discipline, because we're saved, we can experience things that God has for us as disciples that we won't experience if we make the wrong decisions, and in fact, we can have regrets because we didn't. And the, the cool thing is Jesus is the answer in saving us, and Jesus is the answer in empowering us as we strive to make those decisions and grow. You know, we have a power beyond ourselves. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I want you to think about this word trust the rest of the message. Because what we're talking about is different than you and your own willpower. I'm talking about trusting in God to have a disciplined life and things that really matter that I really want the most. Trusting in Christ to deliver me. Trusting in Christ to help me. Trusting in Christ to transform me. Uh, choosing discipline over regret. Choosing what I want most over what I want now. Listen to Paul from another passage, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. I love that. You know, there's some who believe that everybody's supposed to win. So even the last place person gets a little trophy, and then they feel good because we're all winners. But I, I, I think whoever said... It doesn't matter whether you won or lose, but how you played the game must have lost all the time. It's a whole lot better to legitimately win. You show me a good loser, I'll show you a loser. And Paul says, not everybody wins. You've got to run to win. He says, all athletes are what? Disciplined in their training. Training is a an ongoing process. Training is more than a one-time information. When I was a kid and my dad was a barber, one of the blessings was comic books. You know, I had to sweep and some other things that weren't blessings, but good work. But uh, reading these free comic books. And these comic books, you guys remember Archie and some of those comic books? They would have there in the back uh, this skinny guy with this good-looking chick, and then this burly guy steals the girl. 
And so the skinny guy takes a 30-day Charles Atlas class. Then he gets burly through training, and he gets his girlfriend back. And I'd say, wow, I want to be like that. I'm going to be butt. So I would go to the wreck that we had there with the weight room and work out one day and look in the mirror the next day, and it's like I hadn't changed, except I was sore, you know. <laughs> it takes training to transform. Training is repetition. Training is continuing to choose out of conviction to, to make that decision. He says all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. You know, they, they would get a wreath or some kind of temporary uh, prize, but we as God's sons and daughters have an eternal crown, an eternal reward. Now, you can take tests that are like strength finders, and they'll, they'll tell you what your strengths are. I think it's a good thing to do. And uh, they'll have like, there's one that has 34 strength finders. And it has things like some people's strength is to be a maximizer. Some is positivity. Some is a good relator. They can relate with all kinds of people and all kinds of walks of life. Some are developers. Some are achievers. One uh, they have is competition. Some are competitive. That's one of my things, that I am competitive. When I played football, I found out I didn't have the body type and the skill set to play what I call one of the pretty boy uh, um, positions. You know, the guys that get their name in the paper because they catch the ball or uh, they throw the ball and everybody goes, oh, they're so good. They don't, they don't put in the news. Usually the guy that's blocking his head off, you know. And so I was destined to be a lineman, but I didn't want to just be a lineman. I wanted to be the one that hits, that really hits. And so when we did the drills, I would bring it every drill. You know, I believe you practice like you play. And I had a few buddies say, something, hey, lighten up a little, but it's only practice. You know, I, no, I want to hit. And every now and then one of them would put a good dinger on me. And I wanted to get them back because I was competitive. When I became a disciple and I started reading about marriage. So I'm like, I don't want to just get by. I want to have a great marriage. I want to love my wife. And, and I read stuff about Jesus that he talks about how he made this church without spot. He made a radiant bride by laying down his life for his bride, the church. And I realized if I'm going to have a radiant bride, I got to lay down my life for my wife. And that's one reason that some guys don't have radiant wives. They don't lay down their life for their wife like Jesus did for the church. In fact, guys, you want a secret? Here's nine words for the secret of success in marriage. Memorize these words. I'm sorry, dear. I was only thinking of myself. Those are the successful words for marriage. When I became a dad, I wanted to be a good dad. I, uh, I got convicted thinking about, well, you could be a preacher and have kids that don't care or you don't know because you're so busy trying to save everybody else and so I got on the floor and I looked them in the eyes and I talked to them and when I blew it on something I apologized which blew their mind when their dad as big as life apologized to them and now I have a relationship with him when I when I started preaching I had a little new testament my first one and I wrote in there God please help me preach every sermon because it's like it's my last because one day I'll be right and I don't know how, but we've done it. We've made the greatest, most exciting news in the world boring and bored people to death in church, and they feel like they're at a funeral. But I always thought, this is the greatest news there is. So every message, I never feel like, oh, it's another message. I want to do the best that I can. Not because I'm so awesome, it's because I am competitive and I want to bring glory to God. I want to have a church that maintains that gets by. I want to have a church to be a part of a church that impacts the community and shuts the mouths of those who accuse the church of being issue owning and not caring. I want to show them the love of God. Well, we all have strengths and weaknesses. In Corinth, they had these games called the Isminian Games. And uh, it was the year before and the year after the Olympics. And they had this big race, and it was full of all this patriotic pride. And all the athletes would go through this strict training. And Paul was writing to people, the church in that area. And they know about this. These guys would go through 10 months of special training. They would have a strict diet. They would eat, eat no junk. They wouldn't have any booze. They would endure cold and heat and toughen their bodies. Here's another thing. They also ran nude. Now, 
To me, that's a motivator to run to win, because who wants to run behind a naked guy, right? It'd be better to, to run to win and to be in front. Reminds me of the passage in Hebrews, let us strip off everything that hinders us and run the race. There's some motivation. Run to win, Paul says. Well, there's a pain of discipline now if you want to get the prize. you got to do now what helps you achieve what you want the most. I've got to make the decision now to do now, endure the pain now to get what I want the most. So here's a little exercise. Dave did one with us last week. This week, take a moment and think about and write down on your notes, what do you want the most? What do you want? What do you really want? Don't look at your neighbor. Um, Write down what you want the most. Don't put something silly. I want to win the lottery. Uh, I want to marry a different husband. I heard Brad Pitt might be available. Don't put that. Uh, Put down what do you really want seriously the most? Maybe to be close to God, to get in good shape, to take care of the vessel God gave me, to improve my marriage, to be free from addiction, to get out of debt. What is something right now you feel a need that you really want? Because what you... What, what you really want the most can be achievable. But here's the next exercise. What do you need to choose now to achieve what you want the most? Is there something you feel convicted, called, compelled, that you need to do now to achieve what you want the most? You want to be close to God? you got to choose spending time with God. You want to find peace? from having a relationship with God in a chaotic world, that's only found in having a love relationship with your Father in heaven. And you get that through communication, just like any other relationship. So we have to read his word and feed on his word. Some people say, I don't really understand the Bible. I understand where they're coming from, and as I used to think that. Then when I went to Bible school, I thought, is there too much brain damage where I can't really get it? And I found I can learn the word. I can memorize the word. In fact, I think God helps us in our study of the word. As we pray and study, he can help us learn. And there are so many helps now. You can Google what is Genesis about and find writers that give you good introductions about it. Genesis means beginning. It's the book of the beginnings. It's the creation. It's the beginning of the story of God working out through the Israelite nation, his story, his journey through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And you can go to Exodus and you can read about it. It means the exit and God bringing out those Israelite slaves to form a nation out of Egypt and to work out his plan to bring Jesus. And you can do that for every book of the Bible. You can take one book and take your time. Don't go on a guilt trip. The focus is to to listen to God. Read and listen to God. There's so many promises in the Bible. Like you can can read over and over, do not fear, do not fear, do, do not fear. And you can get that in your mind and in your heart, and it can transform you. And then talk to God, pray to God, even when you're mad. Even when you're upset, it's a real relationship. Don't put on this Christian ease and holy father in heaven and talk all spiritual. Father, help me right now. God, you got to help me with it. I don't understand. God, show me the way. Make it clear, God. What do you have for me? Build a relationship and walk with your God. Commit to his church. You know, he has a plan. I didn't think it up. He has a plan for us all who are disciples to commit to a membership. We have something now called Uh, church hopping in our society a lot of people go from church to church and i don't fault people looking around everybody needs to find a church where they can grow they can be a part of the mission they can have fellowship but to never ever ever commit we're missing out on god's plan that's why he has passages about not forsaking the assembly but but coming together to encourage others to live lives of love and good deeds something happens when we worship collectively that we can't do on our own we can draw close to god individually but there's something else that happens just listening to you guys sing second service is a singing service hearing you guys sing every week does something to my heart and i remember sitting there and there were 40 of us saying god are you going to show up are you going to help us before there was a band before there was you know two services god are you going to help us and 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 i still feel that way every week when i come here i feel changed i feel different after worshiping with god god knows what he's talking about commit to worship Commit to be in a growth group. There's things in circles we can't do in rows. 
and, and there's things in building relationships, even with people different than us, that heavenly sandpaper where we learn to love and to forgive and to grow together. Uh, there's things you and I can do if we really want to know God better, be close to God. We got to make the pain. We got to make the decision to go through the change in our lifestyle. If it's to get in shape, you got to do the pain of joining a gym or getting a trainer, or making your own path. If you can't afford a gym, finding a way to work out, to, to, to work on your diet, getting advice. If it's marriage, you got to date your mate. Date, Take care of your mate now, or you'll pay the price later, is what an old mentor used to say to me. Date your mate. If you need counseling, don't be ashamed to get counseling. Some of the greatest marriages have to get help some, from time to time to work through things, and they, they do see success. Um, you may need an NIB conference in your marriage. Capital N, capital I, capital B. You may have, if you have kids, get the, the grandparents or someone from a church to help take care of your kids. A whole, I recommend a whole weekend. And NIB stands for naked in bed. Uh, get some time. You know, it's a shame that, it's a shame that couples have all the hots for each other and they're so trying to be intimate and so crazy and then they let life and they let busyness and they let stress keep them from intimacy. And I don't think it's just a physical thing. I think it's a spiritual thing. And you got to fight for NIB sometimes. You heard it from me, you can thank me later. Uh, <laughs> if you need to be free from something that's bound you, admit it, ask for help, get some counseling, find a group of people that understands what you're going through and work through it together. If you got to get out of debt, you got to do the pain now, stop spending more. There's things like financial peace. You can get Dave Ramsey's book. Even if you can't go to one of his conferences, which are great, if you just read his book, you can get some great principles. If you know someone that seems to be doing well that are givers, that are living within their means, get advice from people. We have people here that we can, can help us in that. Um, you got to go through the hard work now. Choose your pain now to get what you want most. Here's another passage where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.24, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Notice he says purpose in every step. You know, living for God is every step. It's every choice, every decision, how we do family, how we work at our job, how we get along with our neighbors. We've got to make the choices. It's purpose in every step. And you may think, well, you're a pastor. That's easy for you. Uh, but... People who know me well will tell you I'm not disciplined by nature. I'm, I'm, by nature, I am about fun. You know, I'm an otter. There's a tank up in Oregon where a friend gave me a plaque from it, and it says a quote on it. If an otter can't do it and have fun, he won't do it. And that's what I am by nature. But life is not just about fun. If you're going to be a good parent, if you're going to to achieve things in your career, if you're going to endure criticism and difficulties that come with this life, sometimes we got to make the hard choices. That's what I've learned, to follow Jesus no matter what and to, to try to choose purpose in every step. I mean, there's so many distractions. If you love donuts, what a distraction. There's so many good donuts now. Have you noticed that? They even have, they've always had, they've had donut holes for a while, but now they have donut holes that are filled with stuff, you know, and you can get this really good stuff inside of a donut hole. There's so many easy things around us, and we can, we can just say, I don't want to choose the hard thing to deal with this. We can give in. As a parent, we can say, I know I should stop the kids fighting, but I'd rather just give them boxing gloves and let them work it out, tell me who wins, you know, but... <laughs> But I learned that if, if your kids are going through a struggle, let them listen to them and let them deal with it. And that's sometimes how they learn conflict resolution. But if it gets too heated and if it gets too cruel, you've got to step in there and you've got to look them in the eyes and you've got to teach them how to love each other and to forgive each other. I used to make my daughters uh, put their arms around each other and sing that song that was in that movie, Sister. And they would laugh. And that back then they would, oh, I don't want to do it. And they would do it. And now they laugh about that. You got to do the tough stuff of stepping in there, the painful step, and have purpose in every step. There's this Christian psychologist who said something that I read this week uh, that's a lot like what we did in that series, what we read in The God Shaped Brain. And she said that. Um, it's kind of like, say, you want to have some perfect little patch of green grass in front of your house to walk by every day. You've got 
sidewalk or like a lot of us, we have gravel around the edge. <laughs> and you want to walk around that to your car where your driveway is. And you have this beautiful patch of grass that you take care of. And it's like golf course pristine, she said. But if you come out and go, you know, it's shorter. It's easier to just walk straight to the car. And you walk over that patch you're trying to grow. And you come home, you know, I, I probably should walk around, but it's easier to just walk straight to my door. And you do that over and over and over. You don't get that grass that you really wanted. And she said, if we take an easy way on certain things in our life, we build these tracks in our brain where we get some endorphins from the thing we know we don't really want to do, and we keep going on those tracks. But the positive part is, she says, if we start denying those things and do the steps that we really know we want to do, we can build new neurons, new tracks in our brains, and the thing that used to be hard for us gets easier and easier because we're doing what we want most. He says, I walk with purpose in every step. Sometimes we've got to restrain our brain in our old nature. And that could be with food. That can be with stuff, materials. That can be with lust. That can be with whatever we're being uh, attacked with in this fallen world. And I want to just emphasize this over and over as we get close to the end of this message. I, and you and I, will never not need Christ. We need Christ the whole way. We need Christ to save us. We need Christ's grace when we blow it. We need Christ to give us power when we make a choice to keep trying and for him to work through us. And that's part of what's conforming us into the image of Christ as we look to him and we make the choice to follow Christ every day. With Christ's help, you and I can choose discipline over regret. Now look at what you wrote down on the first question, what you want the most. Here's the scary thing. It may be that if you don't do something about it, it could be one of your biggest regrets. And you want to live your life so that you will have no regrets, that you'll refuse to be one of those, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. You won't be that person. Oh, if only I had forgiven that person that I really did love, I could have had a great relationship. I should have taken better care of myself, but now it's too late. I never planned to end up here. Uh, I'd give anything for another chance. I wish I'd have never started that. I had no idea this would ruin my life. That's regrets. We've got to refuse to be short-sighted, refuse to be plagued by regret, and run to win. Run to win and to enjoy the prize. I think of getting to God, and what's really cool is, with God, even when we try certain things and we don't achieve what we had hoped to achieve, but we know we tried in our heart of hearts, we can face God and go, yes, and I think God is so proud of us that we stepped out on faith, that we gave it what we got. So we really don't lose when we attempt things for God with purpose in every step. With Christ's help, we can choose pain over discipline. We can choose discipline, I mean, over regret. And our purpose here as a church is the same thing, making the steps daily to build relationships that last forever. You know, in the context where Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, this discipline stuff, before that, he's talking, he's kind of defending himself. People are putting him down. Oh, that Paul's nothing. He's no apostle. And he's saying to the church where he worked and he poured himself into making disciples, he says, you know I'm your apostle. And then he says this. He says, you know what? I made myself, I belong, though I belong to no man, I made my slave, myself a slave to all men. And to the Jew, I became like the Jews. And then those not under the law, I became like those not under the law. To the strong, I became like the strong. The strong and to the weak, I became like the weak. And he says, I did this to win as many as possible. So focused on his purpose. Then he moves in. That's why I run to win. That's what he's talking about. You and I and our mission and our purpose that God has for us. I don't want to get there and God say, I had so much for, more for you to use through you, to work through you. And you, you, didn't, you didn't take the step with Christ. With Christ, there'll still be pain. There'll still be disappointment, but with him, no regrets. And the answer, like I said at the beginning, is trust. Trusting in him. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I went uh, on a, to a conference in Southern California, and Gina went with me, and Megan, who's our treasurer, went with me. Because one of the things I started thinking is, I hadn't been to, I've been off the grid for six years, but it used to be wherever I went, it was in my agreement, I'm going to go to one to two conferences every year. 
And when I came here, we couldn't afford me. And uh, so I thought, well, I can get stuff online, which is true. You can get great stuff online. But there's things that happen at conferences when leaders come from around the world. In fact, things I learned, like uh, um, sacred cows make good hamburgers. You know, if the horse is dead, dismount. I learned from a guy named Rick Warren about being purpose-driven instead of personality-driven or tradition-driven or comfort-driven or finance-driven. Oh, holy budget. Be driven by the mission, the purpose. I got to see him at this conference and thank him. It was so awesome. And I, I went to a leadership track that challenged my heart in areas I need to grow. Gina went to one on ministries to learn things about ministries. Uh, Megan went to some on finances and financing ministries. And there's something about being there, and you got a 2,000 leaders from around the world that challenge you, because you're in the, in the middle of all the stuff at work. That's why businesses and companies, they do conferences. And, you know, I told the girls that uh, almost always when you travel, there are, there are surprises, and we have to be flexible. And I learned that. Remember my story a few weeks ago about my wife, and I, she, she took me on a business trip, and then I was confessing. I was uh, uh, fussing about her driving on the way back, and she says, I don't know if I'm going to take you to the next one. And I said, oh, I want to be a good traveler. I want to be a good, you got to choose to be a good traveler, you know. So I was sharing with the girls, you never know what may happen. Well, everything went great. I mean, we stood there with thousands of people worshiping and tears down our cheeks, learned really good things that we're excited that's going to help us. And so at the end of the week, I've got to get on a plane to go to Baltimore to meet Trace, and we're going to see all our kids and our grandkids, our new granddaughter, and they got to get back up here. So they're going to fly out of Orange County, and I needed to fly out of LAX. If you ever drove into LAX, that's a cultural experience all in itself. And uh, so I think, you know what, I'll shuttle up there. So you guys don't have to drive me up there. You, they're just going to go to the Orange County Airport. So I shuttle up there. I'm going to take a red eye late at night, and I got my stuff. And I go, it was a great week, a great week. Thank you, God. Everything went great. And I get in the security. you got to empty your pockets. And I go, and there's the rental car key in my pocket that the girls need to drive the rental car uh, down in Orange County in the morning. And I'm like, oh, no. And I'm just like freaking out. I brought them down here. They, they don't have, and I call, I try to call the Advantage local office where we got the car. And just so you know, even though they say they're open to 11, they do not answer their phone to 11. Because I called it over and over and over. And I'm freaking out. And then I get someone on an 800 number for the Advantage somewhere in the country. And they tell me they do not have spare keys. You have got to get that key down. I've got to get on a plane to Baltimore. I'm freaking out. There's no later flight I can get on. I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm praying, and I find this agent, and I say, is there any way you can please uh, help me? And I tell her what's happened. She goes, the only thing I can do is put the key in the baggage claim down below the office, and if they can get up here by the morning, they can get the key. So now I'm still freaking out. I get on the plane. First, I write her this letter. Uh, I wanted her to have all the information because I didn't know who, where this key was going to land that I was going to wrap it in. And it was like a term paper. Wrote my name, my numbers, my social security. No, I didn't write that. But I wrote Gina's and Megan and I explained, please, please get this. Because I'm thinking, I'm going to be out of state. The, the car's in that garage. What are we going to do? And so uh, then in the mo I, I text these huge texts to the girls to let them know what's up. And then I found a friend uh, through Facebook, where I grew up, that's a Christian down in that area we were at. She was going to drive them. But in the morning, when it's time for them to get up, I found out they were already took care of themselves. They were on an Uber, and they're Ubering to the place. And uh, turns out that the driver was an Egyptian who was telling them a story about moving here uh, from Egypt so his, his Christian family would be safe from persecution and they prayed over this guy before they got out at LAX. They got the key and made it back in time. And I was like, yes, but I had two thoughts. One is, maybe it's not there's always a problem when you travel. Maybe I caused the problem when I travel. You know what I mean? And the other thing I thought of is how you never know what God's going to do when you're in the pain. You know what I mean? When you're in the pain, you never know what God's going to do, but you can trust God. So you, that's when I fall apart, when things don't go as I planned, right? And, I don't, and, and you, you start to step, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change, I'm going to transform. You get beat up. God's not gone. God's not gone. We got home yesterday to Sacramento Airport, and I have this big black bag with a yellow stripe, and we're waiting, and Tracy's bag comes, and mine doesn't come, and doesn't come, doesn't come. There's no bag left there except for one black bag with a yellow stripe, but it's smaller, and it's not mine. So that means somebody who had that bag took my bag. 
It's like, yep, there we go again. Like I said, things always happen when you travel, but I'm thinking, no, things always happen when I travel. But uh, someone's got the bag coming tomorrow uh, from the airport to deliver it. God's still on his throne. I'm thankful it wasn't my wife's bag with her makeup. It was my bag, and I got my one pair of jeans for Sunday, so I'm okay, you know. Um, I, I, why am I going on and on? Because I know in this room there's probably somebody that's going through something right now, some pain. And I can't give you any better advice than trust God. Trust God and choose the discipline of trusting in him even when everything within you is crying out. And he will take you through. He will take you through. And he will give you things that you'll be able to achieve more than you ever dreamed possible. Amen? Let's, let's pray together. Father, we want to choose to be disciples We want to choose what we want the most that you've put on our heart over what we want right now in our flesh or what the world says is important. I pray for anybody in pain right now, going through trouble, uh, that doesn't want to take a step, knows they need to, but doesn't want to take a step. Whatever it is, God, give them the strength. Empower them with Christ. And God, help all of us to continue to make those steps as disciples. God, we want to meet you one day with no regrets that we were sold out, that we were bonsai, that we lived to your glory. We lived with purpose in every step. And may you get the credit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. Tomorrow breeze. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and rest. I want, want you one Lord and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to When you don't 
Next week's going to be fun, important over the urgent. Hope you'll be here. And now it's time to pray for our offering. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in giving. We pray that you take this gift, which is a form of our worship, cheerfully. Make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every single day this week, in Christ we always have hope. Thanks for being here, everyone. Ready to shake it up, hope? All things bright. Beautiful you are all things white a wonderful you are in my darkest night you brighten up the sky so
hard for me to hear. 